Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current show, A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023, a collaboration with the Ohio Advisory Group of the National Museum of Women in the Art, located in Washington, D.C. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Michael Lynn Michalik. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize that chat function to ask questions, and we'll be sure to get to them during the Q&A portion of the hour. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. OK, thanks all, and welcome, Michael. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just gonna get started and take it away. So um, I was born in Warren, Ohio. Just a little bit of background. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in painting and drawing from the Ohio State University and also a uh, Bachelor of Arts in Art History and a Master's in Library and Information Science from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg. Mississippi. And I'm here to talk about, I guess, my work today and sort of my process and how um, I kind of got back into my studio practice. So as I was saying, I, you know, went to school for art, I had a career um, working actually at the Wexner Center, almost immediately after school. And I, I had a um, I had a studio practice um, for a, like maybe a couple of years. And then um, and then I feel like life sort of got away from me. I think one, because <clears throat> um, I didn't really find a community of artists that were also parents at the time. So I kind of felt like there wasn't any support network for me. And then also like being a parent itself was all sort of all consuming. And we moved a lot during that time and having young children. Anyway, fast forward, I just always thought that I would have a practice for myself at some point. And that happened maybe about six or seven years ago when my youngest started back into school um, full time. And at that time, I was uh, thinking a lot about what my work would be about. And uh, I, it became sort of a practice for me to make it about the thing that I felt like had prevented me in a way from being an artist or feeling like an artist, which was being a parent. And I began like taking a lot of photos with my cell phone because it was something that I had available and um, making these drawings about these moments. And a lot of it was about moments where both you were in a space with someone and but you weren't you know necessarily connected to them and i think a lot of us felt sort of a, a bit of that during the pandemic like a lot of us shared spaces with families and roommates because we were all locked down um but you could be in a different world because of like your devices or whatever and i started um because like i said i was trained as a painter I started making paintings about sort of my domestic life. And this is um, this is Alice Neal. Um, this is, I think, someone that I look to sort of at, at their work um, as, as a person that made work about domestic life, but without over sentimentalizing it. And um, so she was one of the artists that um, I, 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 you know, was inspired by at the time. And um, so I'm going to show you a series of um, fairly large scale paintings that I made um, about our domestic situation. And to me, like creating narratives is sort of, I think, 
more so than even the figure is more important to me um, than being classified as sort of like a figurative person. And um, for me, the titles of the work are just as important in sort of leading that narrative as, um, as the images themselves. So anyway, I was making these paintings and a lot of the things that, um, a lot of the things that I was interested in, in sort of looking at domestic situations and whatnot, a lot of times I would read a lot about women that painted or did work about domestic life. And this terminology, this term like sentimentality is always thrown back up as sort of a way to describe women that make work about um, their lives and their domestic situations. And at the time I, you know, I, I am offended by that because there are certainly men that have made work about domestic life. I mean, Fairfield Porter painted um, all sorts of domestic sort of, you know, scenes and, and members of his family, but I don't think anyone has ever classified him as sentimental. So for me, I went, I, I was thinking very strongly about this term and like the idea of like, if I'm going to be sentimental, like how's a way to push sentimentality even further? And then sort of looking at things that women have typically been classified or classified as female in art, you know, sentimentality and craft. And, um, and that all ties into the domestic as well. So um, about, I think it was like 2018 or 2019, I was looking at a way to bring craft into my studio practice and bring things like full term domestic. And um, I do have a history of learning how to embroider from my mother. Um, my grandmother was Ukrainian. We, she did a lot of Ukrainian cross stitch and a lot of traditional Ukrainian crafts in our home. My mom, knew how to embroider. I learned how to knit and spin my own yarn and stuff. And I was looking for a way to use sort of those traditional um, practices that I think that we inherit um, as women that are passed down from other women in our own families as a way to make work. So, um, I found a rug tufting gun because I had looked at like knitting and weaving and a lot of those processes are very much, um, you know, there's a, a slowness to it. And I, the thing that I love about painting is sort of the immediacy that you get. So for me, I found someone using a rug tufting gun. And for me, that seem like the thing that could provide the same immediacy that painting provided. Um, and so I, I thought maybe I can draw with this machine. It's a gun that is rapidly sort of injecting these little miniature loops of yarn you work from the back. And so this is, um, this is a piece that um, I did for, um, oh, well, um, sorry, this is a self-portrait, I'm sorry. Um, so I started making work about it, using the same subject matter, but then COVID hit. And for me, um, I had a show that was lined up to happen at the Contemporary Dayton and I'm making work during COVID. I was uh, lucky to have my studio in my house and to sort of be locked down with it. But I also think like being locked down in this situation, it highlighted a lot of both emotional and sort of, um, you know, gendered labor tasks that I never really recognized before were 
seemingly part of my duties. And, and so um, there was a lot of, and I think a lot of women at the time realized there was a lot of invisible labor happening in their lives. And, um, and so the work that I made for the show at the Contemporary um, ended up, I think, highlighting a lot of those sorts of things that I recognized in myself um, that were taking place. So the work was a little bit about this caretaking of others and sort of like the own, you know, anguish and emotional sort of highs and lows of being in this situation and not knowing, you know, when we were ever going to be able to leave our homes and sort of being everything, both like tutor and school teacher, cook and cleaner, and then trying to have my own studio practice as well. Um, here, these are some installation views from my show um, from a basement on a hill that was at the contemporary Dayton. And then for me, this was like sort of the epitome of how I felt like, and I think a lot of people felt during, during COVID was I never expected anything to happen now. So I'm never disappointed. Um, and then this show also, um, I, I also had an installation of a series of um, 60 plus uh, embroideries that were second wave feminism embroideries that were both found, that were all found embroideries. And um, the idea for this sort of, this installation for me came from the fact that I was raised by a mother that preached second wave feminism. And she often, um would you know use the mantra that i think a lot of women from my generation have heard which is you can be anything that you want when you grow up and for me that um i think a lot of women of you know the gen x sort of millennial gender you know in between there um because i'm late gen x sort of borderline um millennial um, we, we realized that that's, that's not a true statement at all, because um, uh, for me, the reason why I left my job and I ended up not having a career and staying home with my children, one of the main reasons was because in the arts, I couldn't afford to have a paying job and afford daycare. Daycare costs more than what I was being paid at my arts job. So, you know, to say in this country that you can still be anything you want to be and realize that the burden of childcare in almost every relationship pinges on, um, you know, the female partner, um, it is just not a fair assessment. And so for me, it was like sort of a struggle. Like I realized like the importantness of, you know, taking care of my children, but I also very much wanted to have my own thing and very much wanted to have my own career. And, you know, and I think that that was a, a struggle. So I was looking at, um, embroideries and textiles and other manner of creative processes in craft that were all embroidery or cross stitch um, that from between the years 1960 and the early 90s, which is sort of when second wave feminism, um, I know there are new theories now about third and fourth wave, but initially that was termed second wave feminism. And so I looked for things that were, you know, from that time period that had things to say about working women, mothers, um, any sort of caretaking or being a wife. And so some of them I just kept as 
these sort of specimens. And then other ones, I tried to incorporate embroideries, um, self-portraits into the work. So I'm just gonna show like a little highlight of some of these pieces. So this was like uh, uh, another, during the seventies, there was just a period of Prairie Girl um, resurgence. So there's a lot of these sort of, you know, Holly Hobby, Prairie Girl-esque figures um, as well in, in a lot of these. And I, I displayed them in like the way that I found them. Some were like not completely done, which I sort of loved that they were abandoned projects. And some were completely not done at all. And I asked other women, because um, it was during COVID anyway, and people, some, some of my friends were looking for things to do. And I asked them if they'd be willing to complete some of these vintage needle points um, from, um, that were in unopened packaging. And this is another shot of the installation that also went along with that other installation. And then um, I started making, this is another solar show that I did in the same year. And a lot of it became about like, uh, this was about sort of, I, I did a lot of research on textiles at the Met. And if you look through their collections, they have some funny little scraps of things that are just portions of rugs. And I was thinking about like what sort of scraps would be left as imagery of COVID if COVID was indeed going to end up being the end of the world. So I made sort of my own scraps from my, my own phone scrolling. And so a lot of these were little images and notes that we used to communicate with each other during COVID. Um, this was a note that my daughter had written, um, my ex-husband, no bra, you weren't. Um, and then screenshots of Facebook pages and whatever that I used to communicate with my family during that time. This is an installation view. But my work started changing and it became less about sort of my domestic um, family life as it became about where I sort of stood in this sort of changing family dynamic. And it was changing sort of for me, not only because my kids were getting older and going to school and like now, now heading off to college and finishing high school or, you know, in, in the middle of high school, um, but also because I ended a long-term relationship with my um, spouse. And um, during that period, um, when we were separating, but still living in the same space, I would find these notes that my um, spouse had written, my ex-spouse had written to himself um, during work. And they, some of them were quite beautiful and hopeful. And some of them, you know, at a time where if you're ever in a relationship and things are ending and it becomes difficult to sort of communicate with the other person, and I made a series of work called Cypher for a husband and they were all found notes in his handwriting. And this is the series of rugs that came from that. And it's his spelling mistakes and everything, you know. And um, yeah, they're all just titled Cypher for a husband. It's difficult, but that's okay. You con you concur, conquer. And then that says killer app at the end. But um, so my work started to become more of a reflection of where my life was going and sort of, you know, I think a lot of people post COVID had sort of this um, 
evaluation of themselves. I don't think that I was the only person. And also I think the age that I'm in, I'm having a change, change in my long-term relationship. My kids are getting older. I mean, it's sort of high time for a, it's a perfect time for a midlife crisis. So um, I was, um, I started, um, I, the reason why I showed this one is because the three statues in the back were just an image that I had like snapped a picture of three statuette heads that were in the Met storage when I was with my friend Heather at the Met. And taking a picture of those statue heads actually ended up changing my work. Um, I started uh, thinking about creating narratives more so than like just directly translating images. And I also became really interested in sort of mythology and where um, image, imagery of women and how we have been classically depicted, typically by men. And this is an image of the piece that is in the Rife show. And these are all tragedy masks from ancient Greek Rome. Um, the, the two, I think it was like the play in, in Medea where the two roles for women are as, as, ascribed as wife and mother. But in classic theater, the two roles are comedy and tragedy, which is um, what I was thinking about while making this piece. And so I started, so like I said, I, I started thinking about where my, how we've been depicted, how sexuality um, has been depicted of women and um, sort of just a historically where I thought I felt, I fell between motherhood and being an artist, fine art and craft um, and sexuality. And um, uh, I, one of the artists that I think I was, I'm, well, not I think, I am very interested in sort of the narrative that they've been able to present is Honoré Cher. And um, I think she's probably classified sort of as a magical realist. Um, but I, I find that the way that she put together narratives very interesting. And I was looking to do that um, another work by Honoré, um, and it, I picked this one because I have a thing with swans. Um, I was very interested in sort of the narratives that she put together. Um, and so this piece is um, a piece that we could not show at the Rife, but, um, uh, you know, looking at sort of sexuality, how women have been portrayed through myth, and how that myth has sort of um, determined certain things about feminism and what it means to be a woman. And um, this kind of leads me up to the work that I am doing now, which um, I am working on a series. It's kind of wrapping up, I'm not sure. Um, uh, with the art, well, that is sort of, for me, it is a tribute to Ree Morton, um, but it's also, I mean, so it's sort of a love letter to her, but it's also a way for me to sort of parallel my life. It, it, she's an artist that I feel very strongly connected to, and the reason is mostly the parallels between our lives. Um, she came into studio making really late in life. Um, she decided to have a family first. And, um, and then when her practice became so important to her, it made a series of difficult choices, which I contend 
also was a series of difficult choices in my own life. And this, you know, she ends up separating from her husband. Um, the, there becomes difficulty with seeing her children. In fact, I think she had sort of a shared custody situation, which was very unusual for the 70s. And um, she died basically, I think in 77, the same year I was born. And while we are both a generation apart, I'm gonna show her work here. Um, you know, I don't feel like in some ways, a lot of things have changed. Um, she received very little recognition during her lifetime. She has a very limited studio practice. And yet to me, like she's one of the most important artists in, you know, uh, seeing her work changed everything for me. This is another piece of hers. So the project that I've been working on is an homage in that I have taken and recreated many of her works using my techniques, but also creating um, a narrative of my own life around, around this. And I do think that a lot of this work, as much as I want to say, I mean, it to me is about it is about divorce and the choices that we have I have made about being a mom and being an artist. This is the largest piece that I have yet made. It is 17 and a half feet high and eight feet wide at the base. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know, I'm sort of proud in that I never thought I would make anything this monumental, but, and this is currently hanging at my show at the Weston. And again, um, so I am interested in sort of recontextualizing this history that, I mean, there's a reference to Lita and the swan here. There is um, the, the piece, the solitary or rarely two piece is a re Morton piece. And um, this one is not at the Weston, but again, another um, piece that I have, it's a jumping off the of previous dissipations part is a re Morton work. And this is my information. If you want to um, see more about my work or if you have some other burning question for me. And okay. okay, I think this is a great opportunity for us to pause for, for questions for folks. And Michael, and when we were chatting before, um, let me go ahead and spotlight both of us. And wow, that made my head really big. There we go. Now it's us. Um, so when we were talking before, I, I have a real interest in the line quality that you have within your work. Could you speak a little bit about, you know, you chatted briefly about that, but there's such a great story behind that. Can you? Yeah. Um, everybody so I, I mean, I, I grew up in Northeast Ohio and in, I went to a very rural school and um, I just was not as well versed in art. In fact, I have to say that like, there are many people that say that they are quote, born an artist. And I don't think I was one of those. I think I went to college, I had an interest, I loved making stuff, but I didn't really think that being an artist was a thing like I, knew that people that had degrees in art taught high school art and I did not want to teach high school art and my experience was very limited so by the time I get to college and I'm going to school I um I just I felt very inadequate because I I you know I'm going with kids that have a depth and breadth 
of experiences in the arts and whether that was like they grew up in Columbus and they took Saturday school at CCAT or they just had a better arts program at their high school. And I had like art 101 that, you know, was just a basic, very generic. So a lot of the way that I work is because I feel like I found these practices and ways of making things that, um, <laughs> there he is. Um, I have a dog and I was said there's probably a point where he's going to bark. Um, I, a lot of the you know ways that I make things is because like I just felt like this was sort of this process that I went through. So I like, you know, take photographs and then I do these weird sort of very simple line drawings. And for me, that was just that's just a, the way that like because I didn't grow up with like this huge practice of drawing still lifes and rendering it. And sure, like you, you touch on that stuff during college, but um, I just, I think my process is so affected by, um, you know, that sort of weird inadequacy, but I just sort of embrace it. And then I, um, that's how I've always made stuff. <laughs> so. So I think that that dovetails nicely into a follow-up question, which is the embracing of reality in um, a variety of ways, not only concept, um, but like the imagery that you portray. So oftentimes you'll have self-portraits in there that like you don't necessarily depict yourself in a, a flattering view. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that choice? Um, and kind of knit that together for us? <clears throat> yeah, I don't think, I think that it started with like these snapshots that I took of my family because I'm very aware of using this device um, that a lot of people use for social media and it's to present themselves in a certain way in a certain light. And I would take photos of anything and everywhere. And a lot of them are really awkward. Like I have a double chin because I am trying to take a photo with me in it, but like something's happening here that I also want to capture. And so to me, it was, it's about sort of this portrayal of being real about what's happening. Yeah, I'm awake at... 2 a.m. and I'm staring at my partner in bed with sort of like burning holes through there because I can't understand how they're asleep and I am thinking of the list of the 10,000 things that need to be done for tomorrow. So yeah, I think that for me, it's not about, I, I, it's like the anti-presentation of this, of the idyllic and so much, you know, is of, early social media, especially with parents and even still like families just trying to show what is termed, you know, living their best life, right? I don't care about living. I don't care about that. <laughs> I don't care about presenting that image. And so um, I think that's where that, that comes from. Um, a more honest view of my self you know. That's great. Um, so folks, again, if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat and we'll get to them. Um, another component that's really important in your work is um, art history. And so can you chat a little bit about how you go about uh, investigating? Is it uh, through lines of interest or is it uh, more ethereal comes as you have experience. It just chat at us. Why I'm asking this is that, you know, oftentimes folks watch these videos and try and place themselves in how they can better affect their own studio practice. So right. I think you have a really great practice in this and I would love for you to chat about it. Well, so I'm, I mean, I'm a lover of research. I mean, that's why I have the master's in library and information science. Um, I, I can fall down a research hole. And so sometimes I think that's, that is a big part of my practice is looking into things, but I found this book and it was called Women and Other Monsters. 
And it sort of went through a variety of classically female mythologies, whether it was Medusa or like the Sphinx and sort of how the qualities of those monsters, if you will, were qualities that would be um, celebrated if it was a male character. And so looking and um, so that's where some of my interest comes with, you know, some of the Greek mythology. And then also just sort of these other tales like of, of Judith, um, who, you know, she, she's a widow and she seduces Holofernes in order to like behead him. And, um, you know, using her sexuality in a way that is for God and country, is perfectly fine. But using your sexuality in other ways, you are a witch. <laughs> so, um, you know, just sort of like, I, I find it really interesting. You know, the, the stories aren't that different from today. You can replace names and some of the circumstances. So it's, you know, for me, it's looking at um, all the qualities in these stories that are repeated again and again, whether it's, you know, from hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, or yesterday. So um, I think it's a way to sort of position um, the, my own personal history, but just, you know, as a woman, but also as an artist and a mother and all these other things. And that's kind of what I'm interested in, like creating or investigating sort of these narratives. Wonderful. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, Margaret would like to know if you ever used Ukrainian embroidery techniques in your process. Um, no, I have not. Um, I have a lot of Ukrainian cross-stitch um, items that my grandmother made, um, but I was too young to really study the technique with her and my parents got divorced and I didn't end up seeing her for a long time. So that's one reason I feel sad that that tradition was not really passed to me. But so I do use embroidery and knitting and some crochet in, um, in some of the pieces um, with, you know, along with the rug tufting techniques, um, but not specifically Ukrainian cross stitch. Um, so I think there's a really natural kind of dovetail there in that uh, and we haven't quite chatted about, which is you do machine tufting, but you also do hand tufting within that. Can you talk a little bit about why and what uh, comes of that that you really appreciate in, in the work? Yeah, so I think like for me, there's it's nice to use the machine because it does speed up but then there is a certain amount of consistency with it because i mean it's created to make commercial rugs so it has to be consistent and the beautiful thing about hand tufting is sort of like i can control like how dense um you know or how i can control the length of the tufts more and then I can trim and cut them with scissors and sort of like that. So for me, it's like using all of the tricks in a painter's sort of repertoire, but like, cause for me, these rugs are a way of painting. Um, and it's just another way to vary sort of the texture and the look of, you know, the fibers. So it's just as important um as the machine using the machine for me but it's also extremely labor intensive like i mean i was working on that i i was lucky i i for this show at the west end that's up until i believe the 21st um that i had a couple of grants that afforded me uh, studio assistance for the first time and so, cause I could have never made that amount of work. And a lot of the pieces are very large. Like I said, that one that was like 17 feet 
it took us six months um, with three of us working on it. I mean, we were working on other pieces for the show, but you know, they were all like 11 feet and eight feet and six feet. There are some smaller ones, but um, just the, the size, the overall size of a lot of the work in that show. I'm just really lucky to have had um, the opportunity to work with other local artists um, here in Dayton to help me um, complete that work in sort of a timely fashion. Wonderful. Well, um, I think I'm going to close this out with this last question. Uh, because empowerment is such a, a really kind of key component, both uh, certainly for you personally through the action of making this work, but particularly for women looking at your work, it has deep meaning and importance there and empowerment there. And I'm uh, curious what your piece of advice would be to perhaps another person in your same situation coming out of, you know, springing forth from the cocoon into their artist self, maybe at a later date. Yeah, I don't know that I'm like great for advice other than, you know, like, I mean, I, I'm doing it, but I also, you know, um, I've thrown a lot of things at the wall and trying to get things to stick. And I don't have the magic formula, but I do think that, you know, if you dedicate yourself to your practice, I mean, that's huge. That in like, I think for me, like the two most useful things were really dedicating myself to making work and putting the time aside. And um, the other thing is like making a community for yourself. And that's like a lot of different things, like to really like, yes, locally finding other artists, but also using, I use social media. I mean, that was a really a huge boon to me um, coming out of, you know, graduating from school where I was kind of laughed because I wanted to send digital images of my work to places. And they were like, no, you have to take slides. <laughs> it's like the last class where they taught slides too. But um yeah, I think to me, like I was able to connect with a lot more artists and galleries and um, ask questions about techniques. And um, and I think like those are really the only two pieces of advice is, you know, find find some supportive people and dedicate yourself to making work. And I don't know, hopefully. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. I think that's really perfect. And we do have a last comment um, from Matthew that said, fiber art renaissance, exclamation <laughs> point, thoroughly encouraged by your growing practice. So yeah. I think that's really lovely. Thanks, so, Matthew. He's also part of my Instagram group. Oh, so That's wonderful. It's wonderful. So thank you again, Mike Lynn, for the generosity of your time and talent. Um, and thank you all for joining us for thank this you. artist talk by Mike Lynn Michaelic as a part of our programming for A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. I'd like to give a special thank you to our curators, Sora Kang and Matt Distel, the participating artists, as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great day.